Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. I wanted to start a new series on cloud security. We've gone through different series throughout the show's history on endpoint management, identity, Windows security. And so we had done a cloud security 101 way, way back, uh, almost a year or so ago. And then we did a CNAP, Cloud Native Application Protection Platform overview with Defender for Cloud about six months ago. And now this is gonna be a follow-up to that CNAP. And we're gonna go through each and every single offering that at least Microsoft has, and I'm gonna try to compare it with other things in the industry like AWS. I'm not as familiar with GCP, but obviously if you're a listener of the show, Adam and I are employees of Microsoft. We work in our security field sales organization. And this is something that we do talk to our customers a lot about. And so we are mostly experts in the Microsoft side of things. We do have some knowledge on the AWS and, you know, I won't speak for Adam, but for me, <laughs> I have some AWS knowledge, very little GCP because I haven't worked in GCP that much. But what we're going to do tonight is start with a Defenders for Server deep dive. And so when we talked about CNAP, we said, Defender for Cloud is this overarching solution that kind of um, is an umbrella over multiple different things. And then we have Defender for such and such that defends each individual thing. So for example, we have Defender for Servers, Defender for APIs, Defender for Storage, Defender for Kubernetes or containers, so on and so forth. And each one of these things is designed to protect your cloud infrastructure mostly for DevOps and developing applications, hosting applications, so on and so forth. So the very, very basics, which almost every organization has are servers, whether you have them in the cloud or on-prem. And so Defender for Servers is that server protection. And you can include with at least Microsoft solution, protection for your infrastructure and servers in AWS and GCP and on-prem, including Azure. And so we're gonna talk about all the different flavors and what it all includes, but understand that this is for servers and this is the most basic thing as part of that umbrella for Defender for Cloud. Okay, so Defender for Servers, it is enabled by subscription or AWS account or GCP project or by log analytics workspace or at the research level, resource level, sorry. So when you go into Azure, if you have linked AWS or GCP to it, you can select those accounts or projects. But of course you also have Azure subscriptions. And so when you go into each one of these, you can enable under Defender for Cloud in the environmental settings, Defender for servers. It's one toggle as part of all those other Defender for so-and-so. Defender for servers is that one thing that you can toggle on and it is at the subscription or account level. And there's two flavors of it. There's a plan one and a plan two. Now, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> we are going to try to explain the complex marketing and licensing of Microsoft to our listeners here. But understand that there is a Defender for Servers Plan 1 and a Defender for Servers Plan 2. And you can only have one plan per subscription, per account, per GCP project, so on and so forth. If you want to mix plan ones and plan twos, you can do that, but they have to be on separate accounts or separate subscriptions. So we, I have seen customers do this where they've mm -hmm. moved servers from one subscription to another, but understand also like there's complexity with that because subscriptions may be 
bill back or something like that for each organization or separated by geographical location. So there are some nuances of that, but just understand from a billing level, you can only have one plan at that level. With Defender for Servers Plan 1, it's the very simplest one. It is essentially your endpoint protection That from the very basic level. You essentially get Defender for Endpoint on your servers. Now, if you know Microsoft's licensing, we actually do have two flavors of Defender for Endpoint, a Plan 1 and a Plan 2. Plan 2 is the one that includes your EDR, your XDR, all of the stuff that comes in the E5 suite. That's like the full Defender for Endpoint. And with Defender for Servers Plan 1, that's that full XDR version. So if you, there is no like basic E3 model for servers. There's only the Plan 1, which includes everything. Now, again, with licensing, it gets complicated. I'm not going to say there isn't at all a, a way to license servers for just Defender for Endpoint, the E3 version. I'm sure there is somewhere a SKU that you can buy. But most organizations go with what we have, what we're talking about tonight, which is Defender for Service Plan 1. If you want that XDR, EDR, Defender for Endpoint for your servers. It also comes with your foundational cloud security posture management. Now that's actually free with any Defender for Cloud. And you don't actually have to have any workload enabled. It just comes with it. So we're going to talk about the foundational cloud security posture management, but know that Defender for Servers Plan 1 will come with that. And then there's a Plan 2, which comes with all sorts of good stuff. Plan 2 comes with, of course, your XDR, EDR, but it also comes with some other things that I'll call out. I'm not going to go through the entire list, but mainly what I see organizations use this Plan 2 for is regulatory compliance. So if you have to have checks on whether or not you're going to match a specific framework that you have compliance regulations to adhere to, this is probably the better way to do that. It also allows you to do agentless scanning of VMs, which is pretty neat. It uses cloud APIs to do this, so you don't have to deploy any agents. And you get some benefits into your log analytics which is the log repository that Microsoft uses in Azure, you get a break on the pricing. You get 500 megabytes per server of free ingestion data. So you get a price break for your storage, which is nice. And if you know Defender for Endpoint, you get vulnerability management with that. Now, with Microsoft, of course, there's a full suite of Defender Vulnerability Management, which includes a whole lot of things, which we'll talk about, but just understand that with Defender for Endpoint, AKA Server Plan 1, you get a flavor of Defender Vulnerability Management, which includes like out-of-date operating system, an inventory of your applications and notification if those apps are out-of-date, basic vulnerability management information. And then with the full suite, you actually get that. You could either buy that on its own, but with Defender for Servers Plan 2, you get the full suite. And it comes with all sorts of things, which we'll break down in a little bit. But understand that you get the full Defender Vulnerability Management Suite, which comes normally, either you have to buy it on its own if you're just like an E5 customer or you want it on its own. So... Um, Some other good stuff with Service Plan 2, and then I'll let Adam jump in here because I know he has a lot to say. Some things that I like with the Plan 2 is just-in-time access for virtual machines. So with just-in-time, this comes with the Plan 2. You can lock down all those incoming inbound traffic requests to port 3389, port 22, WinRM for 5985 and 5986. All those ports are locked down. There's a deny all inbound rule that's put on your network security group automatically 
and you have to request to open up. So the only way to get access to the VMs is to request it just in time after you've already authenticated using hopefully multi-factor and all sorts of other controls before you can get access to the VM. And then another cool thing is adaptive application control. So normally organizations will have VMs routinely run the same processes. With this adaptive application control, it uses machine learning to analyze those applications that are running on the VMs and it creates a list of known safe software. Those allow lists are based on your specific Azure workloads. And then you can, of course, further customize each recommendation. And when you try to run anything that's not defined as safe, you're going to get a security alert. So a lot of good stuff. I just highlighted a few of the things. Adam, what are your thoughts on all of that? Great summary of everything in here. And I'm just going to repeat one point because it's so confusing. Maybe hearing another voice say it might help. Defender for Server Plan 1 includes Defender for Endpoint Plan 2. And I love Andy. I laughed out loud when you said, don't shoot the messenger. I agree that that is suboptimal in naming. Uh, however, that's how it works. So all you really need to know is if you want the full endpoint protection stack, including XDR, that's the, the minimum bar to entry for Defender for Server. And then if you go with Defender for Server Plan 2, you get all that extra goodness that Andy talked about. I want to highlight a couple of things here. Andy mentioned this, but I'll reiterate it. It is absolutely possible, and we have customers doing this to where some servers are plan two and some are plan one. I've had some customers say, like our tier zero, tier one servers, we want those to plan two. Everything else can be plan one. Totally possible. So if you want to mix and match, you do have to do some subscription management, as Andy mentioned, but totally possible. Uh, the other thing, this sounds like it is cloud only. You need to have stuff running in Azure. You need to have stuff running in AWS. This can actually extend to all of your on-premises servers leveraged into technology called Azure Arc. And we've talked about Azure Arc on this show. We had John Joyner on to talk about it. But the very short version is Azure Arc allows a server to use Azure as its control plane, its management plane. And once you've done that, that VM essentially shows up in Azure like any other resource in Azure. And the cool thing is then you can do things like enable Defender for servers and it will auto deploy to it and do all the goodness more or less automatically. And then another thing I'll highlight, which we haven't talked about, but I think is a tremendous benefit, is all of this is built on a consumption model. You do not need to go out and procure licenses. You don't have to buy licenses up front and guess how many licenses you're going to need in the next 6, 9, 12 months. You can turn this on and you don't start paying until you start consuming. So also, if you're doing some cost management and maybe you have some servers that spin down, maybe on the weekends or during off hours, you don't pay for them because this is billed per server hour. So only the hours in which those servers are operational. So this can be a significant savings compared to the old way of buying the licenses where you buy a static license and you pay regardless of how much or how little you actually use it. So love the consumption-based model, very favorable for customers in that if you have fewer servers, you don't have licenses you're stuck with because you have to wait till your next anniversary to get rid of them. You can just turn them off and you stop paying for it immediately within the hour. So really, really customer benefit of that, that pricing model um, as well. And so Andy kind of walked through all of this uh, really well. Uh, the other thing maybe I'll just, again, kind of mention is with the Defender vulnerability management capability, there's a core set of vulnerability management that's built into Defender for Endpoint. And then there's a premium vulnerability management offering if you're on plan two, you get that. So you get the much more enhanced vulnerability management reporting automatically. And then one last note, Andy mentioned log analytics and how there's that free ingestion benefit, 500 megabytes per server per day, which is tremendous. Um, one of the benefits 
of Sentinel moving to a unified pricing model is it used to be, by the way, when you had Microsoft Sentinel, which is Microsoft SIM and Source Solution, uh, it used to be you got two line items on your Azure bill. You got a Sentinel portion and you got a log analytics portion. And this benefit only applied to the log analytics piece. Well, now if you have moved to the unified billing model with Sentinel, this benefit applies to all of it. So this benefit has actually gotten better with the unified Sentinel pricing model to where this acts effectively is not only 500 free megabytes per day per server of log analytics ingestion. If you are putting that in a Sentinel workspace, it's free Sentinel ingestion as well. Now I will caveat this to say that it's specific to certain log types and most customers can't, don't actually have enough logs to hit the whole 500 in a day. So you probably won't be able to use this whole benefit. I'd say most customers wind up about 70 megs per day, but still it's a nice benefit if you're a Sentinel customer or you're looking at Sentinel or you're just doing log analytics, uh, it takes some of that cost away. Now it doesn't make it completely cost neutral with plan one, but I've seen scenarios where this can take almost a third of the cost out um, because of that benefit uh, reducing your cost over there. So some really good benefits to work through it and, and to look at if you're doing all the things here uh, with the plan two offering. So really, really cool stuff with Defender for Server. Um, and certainly I have customers who love this because they're Defender for Endpoint customers on their endpoints, their, their user PCs and whatnot. Uh, but I have customers who use this even if they're CrowdStrike or Sentinel for their client PCs, just because the integration is so tight. It's built into the management plane. And so as I'm in the Azure portal, as I'm in the Defender for Cloud portal, everything's right there. I don't have to go check a different uh, portal or different user interface to get that readout. It's all centralized in one location. And that's super helpful uh, when I'm trying to manage a fleet of servers. So yeah, let's talk about Defender vulnerability management real quick. Mm -hmm. Normally it is a whole nother topic, but because these features are included with Defender for servers, let's take a few minutes to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So Adam mentioned that there's a core set of vulnerability management tools and features included with Defender for Endpoint Plan 2, which is that full XDR version that you would normally get with E5, E5 security, or just straight up Defender for Endpoint Plan 2. A lot of different ways to get it. But if you look at comparative VM solutions on the, uh, on the market, like Nessus or Qualys, or even stuff that's included in, like, say, CrowdStrike, this is that typical stuff. It, it looks at your operating system. It looks at patches. It looks at different CVEs that you're going to be vulnerable to. It looks at software that's installed like Chrome or Firefox or other software. And then it tells you whether or not you're behind on the versions and then gives you that insight. And then you can track it and update it and, and start your vulnerability management program, which you should have. You should have a program that you're meeting with stakeholders different organizations within your company, like your, if you have specific people in finance or HR that have tools that they're using, or for sure the soft, the uh, server management team and other teams that might manage servers, you want them to be updating and scheduling downtime in order to patch. And so that's the basics. With the added capability, that comes with plan two, the Defender vulnerability management, the full suite that comes with Defender for servers plan two, you get other things. And the thing that I see most organizations utilize this for is the ability to block vulnerable applications. So you can create not only a remediation item, but an action item to say, hey, I'm going to block this software until it has been remediated, until it has been updated. You also get the ability to look at browser extensions and whether or not they're out of date or malicious. There's also digital certificate assessment as part of this. Network share analysis. And by network share analysis, I don't mean it's going to scan 
the network files. That's actually part of Defender for Endpoint. When you connect to a network share, you can configure it to scan the files of that share. That's a configuration item that's available already. I'm talking about when you're looking at a network share and you, and you connect to it, it'll do an analysis of the network share and look at the permissions. Is it available to everyone? Read, write. Who is it available to? And it gives you an analysis of the permissions behind that share and whether or not they're something that you want to look at and change. You also get hardware and firmware assessments, which is huge. And then finally, authenticated scan for Windows. So let's talk about that for a second, because typically when you're looking at a vulnerability management program, you want to look at either non-authenticated scans or authenticated scans. And since Microsoft has not typically been in this business, like it's not a Nessus, it's not a Qualys, but we're getting to the point, I think, that it's going to be very close. You can do authenticated scans just with the basic version of Defender for Endpoint Plan 2. You can do authenticated scans of firewalls. So certain firewalls, you can configure authenticated scans for those. But for Windows, in order to do authenticated scans, you have to have this full Defender Vulnerability Management Plan. So again, that comes with that Defender for Servers Plan 2. So a lot of good stuff here. Before and you move we're on, gonna, real quick, uh, yep. you mentioned Qualys a couple of times, and uh, if you've been uh, in this space or have looked at this in the past, you may say, "Wait, wait a minute, Qualys? That sounds familiar." Wasn't Qualys included in Defender for Server Plan Two at one point? And the answer is yes, it was. Um, and for a while, we offered both of them in parallel. You could use Qualys or you could use Defender Vulnerability Management. Now, uh, in the last probably year or so, we did pull the Qualys out of this solution because uh, we feel like MDVM is up to par, if, if not already there, if it's close. Um, but obviously it's something we build in-house, so we'd rather bundle our own stuff than somebody else's. But yes, for a long time, uh, because Microsoft wasn't in this space, we bundled Qualys with it. So if that seems familiar, that's why. So I know we've gone over a lot so far, and I will mention that we will include links to each one of these things in our show notes so that you can compare and look at charts within this documentation because the charts are very comprehensive. The project managers and the technical writers at Microsoft take a lot of pride in keeping this documentation very up to date. So you can do a very good comparison between Defender for Service Plan 1, Defender for Service Plan 2, and then the Defender Vulnerability Management, what's included with each one of those. And then also, our last one that I wanted to talk about is Cloud Security Posture Management, or CSPM. And with you know both Plan 1 and Plan 2 for Defender for Servers, you're going to get that foundational Cloud Security Posture Management. And that includes security recommendations, that secure score with different action items that you can improve on your security posture. And when we say CSPM, like the very basics, do you have VMs with... RDP and SSH enabled with a public IP address, stuff like that, right? Do you have default credentials or weak password and, and local admin? Drive um, encryption. Exactly. BitLocker, mm -hmm. right? So those are posture, security posture things, configurations that the basics can help you with. And then when you get into other things, uh, the the biggest thing, and I'm not going to go deep into the full version of CSPM because that's a whole nother topic, and none of that is actually included with Defender for Service Plan One and Plan Two. But what I, the biggest thing that you know, I will just mention that I see most organizations go to the full version of CSPM is the attack path visualization, mm -hmm. and that is super helpful. And what that is is that it takes vulnerabilities that it sees in all of your data and all of your VM and across your scope. And then it says, okay, from this vulnerability, I can get into this resource and escalate and laterally move and get to this, you know, crown jewel. And it'll map it out for you. It'll essentially think like an attacker 
and show that to you how they how an attacker would actually move through your organization based on your vulnerabilities today so that attack path analysis is really cool but we're gonna we can talk about the whole defender cspm suite in a whole nother show but understand that you're going to get that foundational cloud security posture management with both plan one and plan two and it's going to be at least a good start in managing your security posture. Great call out in, in case someone is doing a checklist or comparison to know that uh, CSPM is actually something we've effectively given away uh, in Azure going all the way back to when it was Azure Security Center. Uh, did it in Azure and then have over time extended it into AWS and GCP and even on-premises as well. So here's another plug for Azure Arc enabling your servers, even if they're sitting on-prem in your own colo or your own data center, if they're ARC onboarded and ARC enabled, then they show up in these reports too. And if you make the connections, it's API level integration with AWS and GCP, it'll leverage kind of the existing uh, effective equivalents over there in, in those platforms to also give you that consolidated view. So one really compelling part of this, even foundational CSPM, is it can give you that readout across your data estate, across your infrastructure estate, uh, not just in Azure, but on-prem and other clouds as well. So really powerful. Um, and then I'll just call this out. There's been a lot of solutions where Microsoft has launched like a, a, a premium Defender Vulnerability Management, a premium CSPM, um, a premium identity governance solution in recent months. And for all of those things, and this included, we didn't take something we were once giving away and then started charging for it. We built new capability, new net, new functionality, and that became a paid offering while respecting and maintaining the existing solution for what it was. So just know if you've been using this for many years and you're saying, oh, what, now you're going to charge me for it? Actually, no. The thing you've been using remains included. Uh, there are additional capabilities available. And like Andy said, we probably can and should do an entire show on Defender CSPM. Yeah. And... I will reiterate one more time that Defender for Servers, Defender for Cloud, is vendor agnostic. It does work in AWS. It works for GCP. It works for on-prem. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know the intricacies of AWS's solutions, but I don't think that they extend to third parties. So Amazon Guard Duty and Security Hub. I don't think will extend to Azure servers. I could be wrong. And if I am, I'll, I'll find out. But um, I don't think that they do. And then also, they don't have an endpoint protection, which is really interesting. Amazon doesn't have its own. If you use AWS, you can go to their marketplace and purchase a third-party EDR solution like CrowdStrike or Sophos or something like that. But Amazon itself doesn't have its own, which is, I think, really interesting. So just know that you're going to get, you don't have to go out and buy something else. You, can, you get XDR and EDR included with the Plan 1 and, of course, with Plan 2 as well. And, and then, as long as you're talking about multi-cloud support, don't forget multi-OS support. Uh, Defender for Servers is absolutely available for Linux VMs as well. Absolutely, yes. Both Windows and Linux. So. Hopefully you learned something. Adam, do you have anything else that you want to add? I'll just do a plus one on the documentation. You talked about this, Andy. It'll be linked in the show notes. Uh, Microsoft documentation can be uneven in quality. I'll own that. <laughs> um, I'm sure most of my peers would as well. I will say the documentation for everything we just talked about is sensational. It's some of the best we have uh, extremely comprehensive, clear, detailed tables that lay out the difference in functionality. And what I love is every line item on that table links to a detailed description of the functionality. So if you see something that says like adaptive application controls, and you're like, oh, what's that? I remember Andy talking about it. You can click on it and it'll take you to the page that talks about that in depth. So really good documentation. I know we threw a lot at you verbally and it's hard to internalize all of it. Uh, focus on the high-level messaging and then go check out the doc and it'll all make sense to you. I'll follow up with one final thing that I want to make sure 
that nobody gets in trouble here because this has happened to some of my customers. People assume that when they buy E3 or E5, that Defender for Endpoint comes with for servers Mm -hmm. and it actually doesn't. So with E3 and E5, there are user licenses and you're going to be licensed to use them on user endpoints, but you're not going to be licensed to do it on servers. So make sure that you have the correct licensing. We do have legacy licensing that you can buy like per server, but Defender for servers here, what we're talking about with these plan ones and plan two, the plan one, if you just want EDR, that's what you have to buy. So make sure that you have the correct licensing for your servers. If you're an organization that went out and bought E5, you're like, have everything. If you didn't include your servers in that as part of the EA, then you technically are not licensed to do that on your servers. So I've seen some organization get in trouble. And I wanted to make sure that that is clear. Great call out. Absolutely. So the E5 covers your user devices, as Andy said, also does not pool. Um, You can have, I believe it's up to five devices per user. Maybe it's more um, for Defender for Endpoint. Uh, You can't just say, well, we have, um, you know, a thousand users times five is we've got 5,000 licenses. And so we're only covering 2,000 endpoints. So we've got 3,000 to play with. So we'll go put on 3,000 servers. It doesn't work that way. Uh, However, uh, Andy referenced this. I'll just clarify this point as a final point again, because we're trying to make this clear. We do still sell and you can still buy and customers have bought a thing called, (laughs) again, don't shoot the messenger, Defender for Endpoint for Server or Defender for Endpoint Server. And it is a SKU. It's a thing you buy on your enterprise agreement. It's $5 per server per month, I think, effectively, something like that. Um, Ask your Microsoft rep for deets. Uh, That is, again, like that kind of, quote, unquote, old school, flat uh, cost. You pay no matter what. If you're using it, if you're not using it, you can uh, add more licenses at any time. You can only trim down at at anniversary, et cetera, et cetera, all the the benefits and drawbacks of an enterprise agreement. What Andy and I talked about, again, consumption-based pricing. You you pay as you use it and not until you use it. So that's the other thing is like, you don't need to go procure a thousand licenses and then they sit for two months while you're rolling it out. You're only paying for them as you roll them out. So this is really the way to go. If you have that existing like SKU, that legacy purchase, And let's say maybe you want the Defender for Server P2 capabilities and you don't want to pay all over again. You want to kind of step up. Talk to your Microsoft account team. There's actually ways to do this. They're way out of scope for this show, but it is actually possible if you want to kind of take those legacy SKUs and marry them with the modern kind of consumption-based model. There's, There's ways to do that. So ask if you need to. And I'm learning about all this pricing stuff too. And if you are part of that, you know, negotiation team, and and I know a lot of IT professionals and managers are in those EA contract negotiations. Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but because it's consumption based, if you have a Mac discount, then that could be applied to this as well, correct? Correct. So some customers have negotiated Azure discounts where they get a discount on all Azure services Uh, that would apply towards this. So that is something you can negotiate. Um, It is actually possible as well to negotiate per meter discounts too. Um, That is possible. Uh, Obviously, you'll need to speak with your Microsoft account team on that. Um, but yes, just, just to be aware, like if you're accustomed to, we get X level of discount on our enterprise agreement. I don't want to come over here and throw that away and pay more for the same thing. I'm not going to do that. Uh, just know there's ways to make you whole. There's ways to, to do, do some of that sort of thing. So if you, if you have something that's preventing you from going to this model, ask, I, I would say your Microsoft account teams are incented. To, to move folks to this consumption-based model because it's better for Microsoft and better for customers. It's truly a win-win. And so if there's blockers preventing you from looking at this as opposed to kind of the legacy EA type model, ask what you need for. Um, and there's probably a way to help get you there in the end. Well, 
great show tonight. This was the first in a deep dive on our Defender for Cloud series, and there'll be more to come. Hopefully you learned something. There's going to be a ton of links and documentations in the show notes, as well as my contact and Adam's contact information if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.